Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. I met Janet about six or seven years ago when I was facilitating a step work group at the secondary facility where she was at that stage. It was great fun to run into her about six months ago at an NA meeting in Somerset West. I was sad to hear that she had relapsed and was fresh out of treatment again. But, as is always the case, I was incredibly happy to see her back in recovery. From day one in that meeting, I was stunned at Janet's commitment to service. She immediately became involved and we have been serving at and driving together to and from meetings ever since. I could not wait for Janet to be one year clean, to ask her to come and talk to us. Not that one year clean time is a prerequisite to be a guest on Meet Me in the Field, but because Janet was very reluctant to share her story before this milestone. Well, I did not wait. One year clean and three days later, yes she is. This podcast is supported by The First Layer, the 12-step workbook on working through the 12 steps in any addiction in 21 sessions. There is also a 24-day coaching and counselling program available based on the first layer. For more information in this regard, go to www.freddy.org.za and click through from the notices at the right of the homepage. Sit back and enjoy. Good morning, Janet. How are you doing? Hi, Freddie. I'm really happy to be here. And I am so happy to have I've you. I've just had such an awesome week, so I'm doing very well, thanks. You had a week of celebrations. Yeah, I certainly did. <laughs> One year clean. <laughs> and you had your birthday the, yeah, the previous the week. the previous week, yes. So, was it accidental that your clean date... No. Was close to your birthday, or was it planned that you were going to give yourself recovery for your birthday? No, or? not at all planned. No. Um, I was house sitting for my mum. They had gone to the Kruger Park, and it was my birthday while they were away. And when they came back, they could see I was not okay, and I was afforded the opportunity to go into treatment. And it's just by sheer coincidence that exactly a week after my birthday, well, it was like six days later that I went there, so it was exactly a week later that oh, I perfect. was my clean date, yeah. So you virtually gave yourself recovery for your birthday? I did, mm. not intending to, yeah. but it turned out that way. My first sponsor, his clean date was his 40th birthday. Oh, he really? Gave him, he gave himself recovery for his 40th birthday. I wish birthday. it had been my 40th, yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately not. <laughs> How did I say? The only meeting that can be, you can be late for is your first. <laughs> yeah. So how are you doing? How's life treating you? It's, yeah, I must say that when I left treatment, I was after six months, I was there for almost six months, and I thought I was actually terrified because I was planning on staying for a year, that was what I was led to believe, and when I left, I was really scared because I didn't know that I could stay clean outside of treatment. Yeah. Is this the longest you've ever been clean so since you've come into recovery? Definitely, okay. yes. There were periods before where I thought I was clean. Because when, if I wasn't using street drugs, I considered that being clean. Ah. But meanwhile, I was using alcohol, not like really badly. Towards the end, it got bad because I just drink to alleviate anxiety. And then I was using a lot of prescription medication for anxiety. And when the meds stopped working, I started drinking alcohol on top of the medication. Okay. Nice little cocktail Lovely. of stuff. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't afford my street drugs anymore. <laughs> Because I'd lost everything through my years of using. I'd use that like once or twice a month if I was what I called lucky then. Party time! Yeah, party time. <laughs> there was a period where I thought that I was clean based on my faith alone. Okay. I wasn't working a 12-step program. I was going to church like six days a week to whatever was, was happening at the church. Whether it be Bible study, prayer meetings three church services on a Sunday. I was uh, working in the office voluntarily, um, helping with interior design even because they were renovating. And I wasn't on street drugs then, but I was substituting my drug of choice with uh, Ritalin. Okay. So I was using Ritalin. I drank alcohol very sparingly to also once again for anxiety. I was on a lot of prescription meds. And I thought that was clean time. So me then, I was clean for uh, almost 21 months, but... I wasn't clean. Okay, yeah. yeah. Are you still on 
anxiety medication? No, nothing. Are you serious? Not a thing. No antidepressants, no, no anxiety, not no... The, the strongest thing that I ever take is Bernardo, although I have taken my page as well. And when I went that is into, amazing. And, and do you experience anxiety and depression? It's and like the most amazing thing. Because when I went into treatment, I looked... We weren't allowed our phones. So for, like for almost six months, I didn't yeah. have a phone. And when I got the phone back, I changed my number because I just wanted... To, I didn't want my ex-boyfriend to, to reach me and all of those things. When I looked at old messages that were still there, not on WhatsApp, but normal text messages, I saw that I'd been saying to my son-in-law, who was the one who paid for the treatment, and who booked me in, who had been there himself three or four years previously. But I need, if I'm going later today, I need meds, because I'll never survive without meds yeah. for anxiety. Well, he was just like not communicating with me, and the next thing I was on the plane. He was not entertaining your bullshit. No, definitely <laughs> not. I literally had about five pills left. I was on Pax and Tripoline then. I had my last glass of wine at Mac and Bean at the airport. <laughs> Before you boarded. Before I boarded, okay, yeah. When I got there, I discovered that, you know, unless you're an extreme case where they'd wean you off, that that treatment center was totally anti yeah, they, any they prescription very, meds. Very well known for their, for their no. And I wasn't in too much. I, I remember, I'm surprised actually that at the time I didn't overreact. But I just accepted it. Oh, wow. So I handed in my little five poles and I thought, oh, I'll probably suffer <laughs> like hell. But at the same time, my life was so unmanageable before <laughs> that um, I, I felt like this, you know, cocooned environment. Yeah. Did I you had, feel safe there? Yes, I felt yeah, safe. I felt so safe in I felt very well. safe. I mm. felt like, um, oh, flip. Well, first of all, there's... You know, being a love addict as well. <laughs> there were all these hot guys hanging so around. So many men, <laughs> so little time. <laughs> and then I had a bed to sleep in, and I had three meals a day, and a routine that I had to stick to. So for me, all that anxiety left me. Fantastic. Like almost immediately. I didn't even need a pole. On my second night, I remember I woke up before bed. I'd gone to bed really early, and I'd woken up. And the house leader at the time gave me a, a mug of warm milk. And the anxiety left and it never came back until the last month when my counsellor said, well, now you actually have to leave in a month's time. to put your big girl panties on and go, girlfriend. (laughs) And I didn't want to leave. But that was not unmanageable anxiety. It was just kind of natural fear of change and fear of different things. Not unmanageable at all. Yeah, and also in that treatment centre, I think unlike a lot of other treatment centres, once a week we would have a informative video and often they would be on prescription meds okay. and a psychiatrist Peter Bragan he used to American he a lot of those videos were ones that he put together okay. and the horrors of actually of prescription medication I mean I never thought it was a problem until I went there <laughs> never <laughs> because when I was in treatment before everybody went to a psychiatrist yeah. and everybody was on meds so um, this was all new to me. Yeah. But I came out of there with a completely new uh, new way of looking at, you know, how awesome. people are treated yeah. for what they think are psychological illnesses. Yes. I always have a, a serious conversations with um, friends of mine in the mental health field mm. about, I think you diagnose addicts too quickly with other stuff instead mm. of letting them get clean. Yes. And be clean for a while and then diagnose them when, when the actual, all the, all the other shit's been dealt with. Because like I was clean for two years when my depression came back big time. Mm. But then you know, you yes. know this, is, this is depression. There was nothing wrong in my life. Yes. So it wasn't a situation. Mm. Then we knew that I suffer from depression. Mm. And then I tried to, through, I went on antidepressants for a while to, to address that. Yes. And I got much better than I went off them. Of, of a period of a year and a half or two years we've been like me off and then two years later it was back mm. so I now know that I, that I suffer from depression yes. so therefore I take one tablet a day and my life goes on yes and well I know that there's a time and a place for it but I just what yeah. I'm trying to say is that like a lot of people are just diagnosed incorrectly yeah. they just go to a GP and, and all this do- <laughs> if, if I get a client in, in my rooms that yeah. says oh I'm an antidepressant and the first thing I ask is who prescribed it mm. they say a doctor I said no I want you to see a psychiatrist. Yeah. Listen, mm-hmm. Janet, so you grew up in Cape Town. Yes, yes, okay. I grew up in Cape Town. In, in city self? Or? Uh, actually, in Pinelands. Okay. And um, when I was 13, my dad was transferred to Bloemfontein, and then he was transferred back to Cape Town, 
after 18 months and uh, went so back you, to So you were an Afrikaner girl for oh, 18 months. Oh, yes, I learned, I learned a lot of Afrikaans there. Yeah, I, like, I mean, our, in, our Afrikaans at school there was totally different to the Afrikaans in school in Cape Town. I was like, I think I was probably a great age, you know, in my grades yeah. because uh, my Afrikaans was hopeless, but I learned a lot there. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then I later on went to work for uh, Afrikaans boss at Metropolitan. Okay. So I learned a lot there as well. So it's so a big hit to it all. So you can't tell who? Yeah, I can. Oh, cool. Okay. So father English, mother English, mm. British English or South African English? British English. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. generation were they? Third generation. Okay. Yeah. Your surname though, oh no, but you were married. Yes. Is Jewish. It's Jewish. Were Finnish you? Jewish, yeah. Finnish Jewish? Yeah. My oh, late wow. husband was Finnish. Your what? Late husband was okay. Finnish. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you ever go to Finland? Yes, lots. All over Scandinavia. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my no, husband spent studied a lot of in Finland. So he did his PhD there. So oh, he wow. lived there for seven years. Yeah. In Tampere. Oh, no. Yeah, I remember Tampere. I don't okay. remember what it looks like, but we travelled quite a lot around Finland. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. No, I love Scandinavia. So he was a Jewish Finn? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And your family of origin, your folks, were they Christian? Yeah, Jewish. no, Christian. In fact, when we were children, they were both quite firm believers, but they actually didn't go to church okay. themselves. But we were all, there were three of us, I was the oldest, and we were forced to go to Sunday school every week. So I went quite reluctantly and rebelliously. <laughs> but, you know, obviously when I was a young child, it was nice. But when I got to my mid-teens and I'd become a rebel and hung around the hippie market in Cape Town and... Loved, you know, that whole piece. Was that Green piece. Market Square? Uh, yeah. Long Street, actually. Okay. No, not Long Street, Bree Street. With, uh, it was like the post-Woodstock era, hippies, peace, love, freedom, happiness. Oh, you know, but I wasn't into, I didn't ever touch any drugs then. I just uh, loved these guys with long hair yeah. and all these like flowing dresses and psychedelic bell bottoms and <laughs> that whole thing, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So were you a... Rebellious teenager. Yeah, sounds like definitely. It. I remember, um, in fact, last week drove through Pinelands, and I spotted this house. And I remembered when I was twelve, at the end of grade seven, it was then standard five. We went. We, a whole lot of us went to this guy's house after school. His parents were away, and it, all the guys were drinking beer. and And I smoked my first cigarette. Okay. When I was 12. And um, I have had many, many, many years that I haven't smoked in between. But at the moment, I'm a pretty heavy smoker. Yeah, and I was very rebellious as a teenager. I was always getting sent out of assembly and Saturday morning detention and smoking and bunking. Fizz ed. I think I bunked up swimming for the whole of <laughs> uh, grade nine. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. Why? I just, I don't know why. Um... You mean, why was I rebellious? Why were you you so rebellious? Was there drama in the house? Uh, I think, yeah, I I think I know. I do think I know why. Because my parents were very strict. Okay. They were too strict. They were very authoritarian. There was, like, very little love. But everything was about appearances. Like, we had to be immaculately dressed. The house was so spotless, it looked like a museum inside. (laughs) So it was all about appearances. On the outside, everything looked fantastic. Keeping up the appearances. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and my mom is quite a snob that way as well. Still is. So I think I rebelled against this whole thing. Plus, a lot of my friends were given a lot more freedom than I was. Okay. Oh, yes. So you could see the the, the, the I could see. I mean, their parents were far more liberal and they were allowed out more. They were able to spend time with each other. And I remember my whole mantra to my parents was like, freedom for teenagers. (laughs) So, and we would would fight incessantly about that. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's where the rebellious um, streak came from. And were you a bad example to your siblings? Were they rebellious as well or were they okay to... Uh, My sister was fairly compliant. My brother, who was three and a half years younger than me, was just as much of a rebel as I was. And also Mm -hmm. like into heavy rock and he was smoking marijuana from like about the age of 16 and yeah, I know he was he was the worst and I was the second worst. My sister, the youngest, was great as far as they were concerned. (laughs) Shame the poor child. Yeah. (laughs) What happened after school? I was actually just thinking about this the other day when I was working, doing step work. All decisions that I made were made around what I never knew then was my addiction. Okay. I didn't. Re- I knew nothing about the disease of addiction, 
had I known, maybe something would have clicked in me that maybe, just maybe, I was a love addict. Okay. And that was the first manifestation of my disease. Ah. Because every decision that I made was based around my love life. Okay. So I intended, obviously, to study after school, as most people do. But by then, by the age of 18, oh, I, I finished my trick at 17, but I'd already been in a relationship uh, for two years okay. with a guy who was uh, seven years older than me. We met oh, at the, the ice rink. Oh, yeah, that. they loved it because he had long <laughs> hair as well. And he lived on the wrong side of town. Oh, my God. So, wrong side of the tra- yeah. railroad. Rail, 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 so line. after six months, they forbade us to see one another. And we just did. I managed to see him once a week. Possibly the worst thing to forbid a teenager. No, no, it was terrible. They're going to find a way to do it. No, no, it was (laughs) terrible. So we, I had drama classes in town then on a Saturday morning. So we'd meet in Cape Town, City Centre on a Saturday morning. And then after another year, they said, okay, we could see each other again. So, but anyway, so because they were so strict and so basically anti this relationship, Mm. we decided that we wanted to move in together. Okay. Therefore, I was not going to study after school. I was just going to start working so that I could be independent and we could mo- move in yeah. together. Because this relationship was oh, like wow. everything okay, yeah. to me. Like he was everything to me. And everything else was of secondary importance. I did a crash secretarial course for like six months. Went to work for Metropolitan. As Where were they? In town at those? In yeah, in Wall Street. Okay. Yeah. In fact, they were called Homes Trust Life. Oh, I would. And then they amalgamated with Metropolitan. And in the beginning, they were called Metropolitan Homes Trust. Okay. And um, I worked there for about four years. And as fate would have it, <laughs> I'd know sooner. I'm telling you, it was probably a month. This is what happened. Now we can actually start to plan to move in together. Unknown to me, his whole family were very... I didn't even pick it up because the parents didn't shove it down our throats. They were very religious yeah. to such a point that all churches were wrong. Like only oh the Bible word. was right. Okay. So women don't wear pants. They don't wear makeup. You don't cut your hair. You don't go to the beach. That's exposing your body. You don't go to movies. Even going to the spur would be like controversial yeah. because it's mixing with worldly people. Obviously, by now, we had, we'd been together for two years. We'd started a physical relationship. And then what happened was we went to Greenpoint Stadium, that was in a, which was then Greenpoint Stadium. And there was an evangelist here from Canada. And he had six brothers and sisters. And we all went that night. Don't, I don't know how it happened, but we just did. And there was an altar call. You know what an altar call is? When no. they call people up if they want to be born again oh, yes. and give their lives mm-hmm. over to Christ. And we went forward at the altar call. You and him? In me and him. and Not discussing it before no, that you're going to do it? not at all. And one or two of his brothers and sisters as well. And I didn't realize then the ramifications of that decision because suddenly now we had to adhere to the parents' rules. And that was all the things that I've just mentioned. Yeah. Like you don't wear pants. Women yeah. don't wear pants. Women don't cut their hair. Women don't wear makeup. Was it, is it Jehovah's Witness? No, it sounds like it, but okay, it wasn't. Yeah. It was like I've actually never come across another bunch of people okay. like that. <laughs> a bunch and a, a bunch, of, <laughs> bunch of people. And it was hectic because, I mean, I was 18. Yeah. I just could have my first taste of freedom. Suddenly, oh, boy, I, yeah. my life is even... And now I have to adhere to stricter rules, if yeah. you want to call it rules, than ever before. And I like did my utmost to start believing in all this so that I felt that I was doing it for me, not just because I was listening to what somebody else was telling me what to do. So I found it really, really, really hard. And I stuck it out for another two years and I just couldn't anymore. Okay. So you were then still living with your folks? Yeah. Because your your religion prohibited you from 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 living together. Yeah. And then after two years you broke up with him? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it was five years altogether. So I switched apartments at work. Um, and I'd gone to work for the computer systems and data processing departments. And all the cool people were there. All the IT people. All the dope smoking geeks. Yeah, and every <laughs> Friday was pub lunches and not go back to work. Even oh. the bosses would join us. So it was a lot of fun. And I met my first husband there. Okay. Yeah. And where did you stand religiously then? Were you then um, religious oh, yes. against it? Or? No, I was... Look, I've always kept the same religious beliefs. Okay. But when I left... When I left that boyfriend, 
and I started doing things that normal people do. Um, and this is all like, I mean, although I mentioned pub lunches, I was not into drinking at all. I certainly was not into drugs. I still felt just by doing the other things, normal things like going to movies, going to the beach, yeah. you know, wearing jeans again, dressing the way that pe- teenagers dress yeah. or young, young adults. adults dress, yeah. um, and initially I felt that I would be, I honestly initially felt that I would be struck down by bolts of lightning for my sins. Oh, wow. So it was tough. But at the same time, I was like loving it. You know, it was like, I could now be me again. I felt like, although I wanted to adopt all of their beliefs and principles, it just really, it just, it just didn't, it wasn't there. It did not resonate with you. Basically what they all believed, yes, but why have all these rules around it? Yeah. So I found that very hard. And initially, as I say, I really felt like now I'm the world's biggest sinner. And I'm going to be, um, if I have to die now, I'll go straight to hell. Ugh. And I could... That's the worst feeling. Yeah, no, it wasn't nice. But I think what sort of overrode that was the fact that I was actually now just enjoying my life okay. again. You know, meeting a lot of new people, doing a lot of fun things. Nothing over the top. Because this was now, what, the early 70s? This was 1979. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we married in 1979. And actually, we'd only known each other for six months in, okay. when we got married, yeah. He passed away? No, I, he, I was married to him for eight years. Okay. We had two children, Ryan and Andrea. After three years we had Ryan, three, three years of marriage. But it wasn't a happy marriage. There was a lot of um, a lot of fighting. He was very, very, very controlling. Okay. And there was a lot of fighting and a lot of emotional... So it's interesting how you come from a controlling father and mother yeah. and you marry a controlling husband. Yeah. It's freaky, hey? It is. It happens so often. The Very, yeah. Alcoholic, uh, often. Al- uh, alcoholic child marries an alcoholic. Okay? Yes. Yeah, no, really? totally. I quite agree. And I've yeah. often, I have often used to think of it then. Like one, from one totally controlling situation straight into another yeah. one. And then even in between, although that wasn't a choice, That's but it just turned out that that the rules around that yeah. religion, the rules around it was very controlling. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, we divorced after eight years. And, and were you still attending some form of church at that, that no. stage? No. Okay, so well, once I left my first boyfriend, I never went back to okay. church. Then, ever. Cool. So. Right, so now you're divorced and still in Cape Town. Still in Cape Town. Now I've left him. And I've moved with the two children into a flat Greenpoint. Okay. But meanwhile, I'd <laughs> love addict through and through one <laughs> relationship straight into another. Uh-huh. I've already met my second husband like ten years before oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah, I met him at a business at a business Christmas party. Yeah, we st- we started seeing each other like once or twice a week, and long, nine months later, I moved in. Okay. To Camps Bay, yeah. Oh, nice. So yeah, now but, you, now, but by now... Now you, now you move up in the, so, in the social <laughs> but, circle. Yeah, but by now I'd actually moved to Camps Bay myself as okay. well. And I had a flat in Camps Bay. Flip, when I think about the rentals then, I think, that, <laughs> I think the rent of that flat, which was huge, with three, no, two big bedrooms, stunning big lounge, a, a balcony with a sea view, which was like 350 rent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm really telling my age oh, here now. But that's what it was. Oi, and you're still with Metropolitan, or have you stopped working now? No, 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 no. I was, I'd left Metropolitan, and at that stage, I'd gone to work for, I'd gone to work in the showroom for Constantia Carpet Malls. I don't okay. know if, they, if you know, I don't even know if Constantia Carpets are still going, I have no idea. So I worked there, and, um, and then I went to work for, when we were dating, and when I moved into that flat in um, Camps Bay, I started to work for Edgar's, for the management team, okay. like doing sales analysis okay. and stuff like that. And I, I just started doing a little bit of merchandising for accessories department. Oh, nice. And I loved working for Edgar's. Actually, I loved it. I loved that job. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was very, very nice. Okay. So now you, and he was Jewish? Yes, okay. he was Jewish. And yeah. did you convert? I started converting, uh, not at his request, because... Okay. Although he was Jewish, he wasn't at all religious. Okay. Um, we'd go to shul twice a year on the anniversary of his mom's death and for Yom Kippur. Okay. And I would fast then, which was hell, but I'd <laughs> fast for the day. But he wasn't religious and he certainly didn't he expect me to convert to Judaism. 
but out of my own I started attending conversion classes and I loved the Hebrew because I love languages so okay. the Hebrew was quite easy for me to learn oh, and uh, yeah and I quite oh, really? I quite enjoyed the whole thing until I was told that we have to renounce Christ and I just couldn't do it okay because of my uh, you know my spiritual beliefs that I grew up with and what I what had happened later on in life, you know, everything, a combination, I just couldn't do it. Okay. So I pulled out of the the classes. It hadn't been important to him, so I didn't continue okay. with it. And what then? Were you in no man's land spiritually? Uh, spiritually, yeah, yeah, in a way. As I say, the beliefs never went away, but I certainly wasn't practicing okay. any f- form of religion or spirituality okay you know my deep-seated beliefs were still there but i wasn't doing cool. yeah not and did you have any children yes you yes. must have with one son yes, yes. We, we, we'd been married we weren't going to because we each had a son and daughter from a previous marriage and then um we'd been married for 10 years already and i looked after my brother's child because his wife had gone into hospital to have a baby and the brother's child was three and while I looked after this three-year-old, I thought, no, I want to have another child. Okay. And I was then already 39. So I went to my husband and I said, this is the story. And he said, not a chance. And I, so I went to sulk and sleep in the spare bedroom for two nights. <laughs> <laughs> and That's then, not the way to have a baby. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But after a few, we had a very... We had a, actually a stunning marriage. Is it? Yeah, very. We hardly ever fought. I think I can remember one fight in 17 years. Oh, wow. I'm sure there were smaller fights, but that was one yeah. big one. So after about a week or less, he came to me and he said, he actually didn't even come to me. He gave me this card and it was a black and white photo on the front with a man and woman's holding, man and woman's hands holding hands. And inside was written, let's do it. Your personal, personal sperm bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and then I felt pregnant about a month later. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh wow. And I turned forty halfway through the pregnancy. And what was the next big thing? Yeah, well when Nicholas was the Lot Lamaki, when Nicholas was three. No. The other children were now what fourteen. Fourteen and sixteen. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Fourteen and sixteen. So there's a big age gap gap. But we all lived very happily then. Were his two children with you guys as well? No, or were they, with they were wife? quite a lot older. Okay. His wife actually was alcoholic. Okay. And he went through hell with her. And they had divorced many, many years before that. Okay. And the kids used to see their mom, but they, they lived with him when they got divorced. Okay. He had custody. Okay. I thought that our relationship was sort of okay. Sort of okay. But it actually wasn't. It, I only found out later on after he got ill how badly they actually felt towards me. They, oh, no. I just don't think they would have accepted anybody. Okay. So, so the next big thing was he had four companies, one in Joburg, one in London, two in Cape Town, and he sold all four companies when Nicholas was, could even have been when I was pregnant. Well, there was in the first year of Nicholas's life. Invested everything into one Nasdaq share on the advice of a friend of his. And oh. well, this is a, a stu- you know, even I, who's no financial wizard or businesswoman by any stretch of the imagination, would know not to put all your eggs in one basket. I don't know what made him do it, but it was on the advice of a friend of his, and the owner of that specific company was also a friend of his uh, in the States. He ended up losing Ev. Thing. Oh my God! Yeah, because over what period of time? About a year. So and within one year, having out. four companies. Yeah. And it's a year later, he had nothing. Yeah, we no. I think probably after he sold the companies and we had the investments going, we probably f- for a year were absolutely flying high. Like there was, there would ne- no, no matter how much money we spent, we'd always have yeah. a shitload more money. Oh. Because um, if I remember, uh, oh, if, I, if, yeah. <laughs> if I remember correctly, those investments went up to something like seventy million rand. Oh, I'm not even my joking. God. And then slowly it started. Why didn't he pull out then when it was like thirty million? I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he, but then in two thousand and one, everything fell apart. Mm. I actually found out for years this used to bother me. I haven't even thought about it for ages now. But my sister's mother-in-law, for some stupid reason, it's a long story, put a curse on me. Okay. So 
that later on I discovered that night, the same day that she put the curse, that night, my son used heroin for the first time. Oh, my God. A few That's now the oldest one, the My oldest one, yeah. Ryan, yeah. My not, first, the no, not the four-year-old. Not the four-year-old. That is a stupid no. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ryan used heroin. And then my husband, uh, the shares that where all the investments were started yeah. dropping. And then about six months later, he was diagnosed with a brain tumour. Oh, my word. An inoperable, worst type of brain tumour that you can get. So oh, my God. in the space of less than a year, in fact, pro- probably around six months, everything just started falling apart. Gone for a ball of shit. Yeah. A brain. How did you cope with all of this? The I turned back to you. God. Okay. Yeah. I used to spend a lot of time praying. I started going to the church in Hart Bay. Um, Which church did you go to now? Jewish? When then? Yeah. Shul or... Oh, no. Not Shul. No. It was like a born-again Christian okay. church. It wasn't a church building. It was in the in- international school's um, school hall. Right so, next to the treatment center you landed up in. Anyway, <laughs> moving on swiftly. Okay, so so now you are tapping into God for to, to get you through this difficult period. Yeah, okay. Very and how much long so. was your husband alive for the brain tumor? When he was diagnosed, okay, he, uh, first of all, I could see something wasn't okay. I actually thought he was getting Alzheimer's or something. Then he said he's going on a business trip, and I thought, oh, how the heck is he going to cope with a business trip? You know, didn't make sense. Then he was like, no, don't come to the airport. Michael, his son, is going to take me. And I said to him, there's something that you're not telling me. And he looked like guilty. Uh, less than a week later, I got a friend, a phone call from his, fr- his very good friend that I'm still good friends with in London. They'd actually gone on a ski trip and he had fallen down in the snow and been admitted to hospital. So when he came back to Cape Town weeks later... I could see, now he looked even worse because the cabin pressure of the aircraft had, and we didn't know about the tumour then, but it increased the swelling around the tumour. So the very next day I took him to City Park to his specialist physician. He was there the whole day having tests. And when the results came back at the end of the day after numerous tests, brain scans, all sorts of things, he was given, He was, uh, we were told about this particular, and I don't remember the name of it anymore, but this particular type of tumour. That is tentacles. It's not like on top of the brain. It's like okay. inside. You can't operate Oof. on it. And he was given two weeks to live. Two weeks. Two weeks. Without treatment, he would have lived another two weeks. So he went straight into hospital, was put on cortisone, came out, and then it was radiotherapy and chemotherapy every day for five days of the week for months, three to six months. And then he bloated up from the cortisone. His hair fell out and his memory just went so fast. And he ended up being sick for three years. Oh, my word. Yeah. So he lived for another three years, not two weeks. But it was actually hell. Three years of hell. It was hell, yeah. It was hell. It's nearly like keeping somebody artificially alive. Yeah, it was especially, I think it was especially hard for um, the children and mostly Nicholas. Yeah. Because, and... Because he's now four, five, six, somewhere there. Yeah, it was, he was dark when he was, he was three when his dad was diagnosed and he was seven when his dad passed away. And you don't know why he lied to you and said he's going out on a business trip while he went on a skiing trip. You know why I think was because we'd already started losing the money. And, you know, he'd actually asked me, because of course I was this, you know, wonderful. I mean, I wasn't like into bridge parties or golf or anything like that or, or drinks with the girls. But um, I did have a lovely life. And then he asked me if I'd go back to work, and I was only too happy to go back to work. Okay. I loved it. But then I only worked for two months, and then I had to take him to hospital five days a week. Okay. So, oh, so you um, were working at that stage? Mm, oh, okay. Yeah, I was working. So then I had to stop working once I had to take him to hospital five days a week because he couldn't drive himself. And then eventually I had to take the car keys away, take the laptop away because mm-hmm. he was just creating chaos with everything that he did because he didn't know what he was doing. He yeah. just didn't know any better. So what did you live on? Well, we still had some money. Plus, we sold that that house. It that had been a small holding with three cottages, five stables, five uh, huge paddocks. Sure. You know, three acres, river frontage, yeah. a massive, oh, wow. massive, a triple garage with a huge entertainment <laughs> room above that with a full size snooker table yeah. and a pub like the Mount Nelson <laughs> Hotel, and a sauna and all of that. With grief. So we sold that, and then we bought a lesser home. Okay, so but you now, used that. that. 
So we had that money, and plus he'd lent money to this friend in UK, and that friend was paying us back 50,000 rand a month. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that helped a lot. It, yeah, yeah. Cool. Without that, we would have yeah. been really struggling. And that wasn't the last time we downsized houses. After that, we needed to downsize again. Okay. So now a husband is ill mm. and other son has started using heroin. Mm. True. You know, Ryan, in retrospect, he was a fantastic, easy baby and toddler. But like from halfway through primary school, I could see things weren't okay with him. He was very antisocial. He isolated a lot. Didn't have a lot of friends, didn't sort of coast it through school, sort of just above average, didn't put in any effort, didn't want to do sport. Um, then he started partying and I was happy for him just that he was going out. So yeah. he never, to me drugs was like a completely different world. Never thought about Knew it. Knew nothing no. about it. Yeah, it was tough because Ryan just want, was on one mission after a, about a year of his active addiction. Even though in and out of treatment centers, he actually just wanted to die. And that was it. Okay. Yeah, a lot of suicide attempts. And um, it was hard. Yeah, it was hard. Because this is now still while husband is sick as well. Mm. Oh, mm. my word. Mm. And you're hanging on to the church for... Yeah, like yeah, very point. much yeah. so. Thank God for that. Yeah, no, I was very much hanging on to that. And I couldn't always go to church because of time. I had no time for myself. Because now you still have a teenage daughter. Yeah, I've got a and teenage a daughter. Pre teen son. And a, a, yeah, Nicholas at that stage was between the ages of like four and seven. Okay. And he was around about 17. Ryan was 19. And Andy did not. Andy and her brother, Ryan, had always had a rough, rela- rough relationship. They fought a lot. Okay. And she was constantly asking me to kick him out of the house, and I just couldn't do it. So that created conflict between mm, mm. her and I as well. Yeah. So they weren't exactly happy times. Yeah, shame. But somehow I just get through it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So who passed away first? Um, well, what happened was my husband passed away first. He got pneumonia. He'd just been getting steadily worse. And that day he just actually didn't regain consciousness. Okay. And um, he passed away in the bed with me holding his hand. Okay. And then 12 days later, my son took his life. Oh, my God. Yeah. 12 days mm. later. Yeah. He, but you know what? He had, he, when I found his suicide note, he had started trying to kill him. Well, I mean, even in the year before, there had been occasions. But that particular, this was now, he was now seriously on a mission to end his life. And when I found his suicide note, he ended up passing away on the... My husband passed away on the 12th of June, 2006, and ran on the 25th of June. His suicide note started on the 4th of May. Oh, my word. And every every suicide attempt, he'd add on another yeah. paragraph. And you could see when he'd been using, by the way, that oh, he wrote. You know, it was like scribbles yeah. and arrows and... see. Uh, How the hell do you cope? So, the first thing that comes to my mind is this... Absolute dichotomy of a husband fighting for his life and a child trying not to live. Yeah. What a weird thing. Yeah, it was. And then how the hell do you cope with those two intense deaths in a row? I have no idea. You know, I remember one time when our border collie jumped, when we used to live in Clifton before Hart Bay, and the border collie jumped over the one dog, jumped over the wall to the neighbor's house, and the, there were two German shepherds, and they ripped her to pieces. Oh, no. And Ryan and I cried. Every night, because I would, I'd always tuck the kids in bedtime stories, tickle backs, all of that yeah. stuff. And Ryan and I cried at bedtime every night, I think, for six months. And I thought to myself, how on earth do people cope with yeah. the death of a loved one if I can't cope with the death of an, a pet? Yeah. And every time a pet died, I'd fall apart. As far as my husband was concerned... To be honest, it was a blessing. It wasn't unexpected. No, yeah, it wasn't unexpected. And, and neither was Ryan's unexpected. Okay, yeah. With my husband, it was like a blessing because yeah. we all felt like we just couldn't do this anymore. Yeah, I hear you. And then with Ryan, you know what? I was, I definitely was in shock that whole day because I remember sitting in the lounge of that house just staring at one spot and a lot of people coming and going, the, the family and friends, and I just, I don't think they even moved. And I was sort of, yeah, definitely in shock because I was like sort of happy for him, you know, yeah. that he was out of, away from all that pain that he'd been trying to escape. And I remember thinking that somehow when you really think that you'll never be able to do what you have to go through, 
that God is there helping you through it. Yeah. Because okay. there was no, I can't, I still can't believe that I got through it like I did. I'm not saying that I was happy. Of course I wasn't happy. Yeah, of course. But, and I remember the florist coming there like twice a day, if not more often, that house looked like a florist shop <laughs> because of like two deaths so close together. And I remember the one time that she came and I met her at the security gate and I was crying all over the place. And she said, oh, my heart, I don't know what to say to you. She said, I can't believe that this is so terrible. But I just, you just do, Kai. Yeah. You just do. You have to. Especially I had a lot, Lamaki, anyway, yeah. you know. So you know what, 47? Then. Yeah. Uh, I'll never ask you your age on air. <laughs> um, was I 47? 46? 46, yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, kill me for a year. <laughs> no, sorry, yeah, but that year is like really important to me. <laughs> okay. What now? So now we pick up the pieces and in picking up the pieces, even before they both passed away, was that okay, okay, now now I'm, you know, the love addict, now I'm in a new relationship already. Okay. But before that, I know that I told you that story about discovering cocaine in yes. my safe. So now I've tried, for the first time in my life, I've tried a drug. Okay. So that was still while Ryan and husband were alive? Yes, because in okay. actual fact, while Ryan was alive, um, now we moved houses again. So while Ryan was alive, even, I had tried cocaine a few times, then decided, no, I'm becoming a drug addict, so I'm going to just leave it alone. Certainly wasn't addicted. It wasn't something that I thought about every day yeah. or even every week. Um, but I do remember one day I was doing painting stuff to do with the renovations and I just said to Ryan, oh, let, let me just try your heroin. And I tried the heroin and I actually hated it because it made me nauseous. Are you serious? Yes. He gave me heroin on a plate and I think it was the size of a pinhead, uh, which I snorted. Yeah. And I, it made me very nauseous, and I thought it's disgusting. <laughs> and then, but for, but it's clearly that sort of sick insanity of the disease of addiction was there because I remember he was at work when I was painting, and then I messaged him or phoned him at work, and I said, "Where where do you keep your heroin? Because I want some more." And um, he said, "No, mum, no, I'm not telling you because you'll end up like me." And he was right. But that wasn't uh, my drug of choice, as no. you know. It was cocaine that I found in the safe. But as I say, I left it alone. There was like three times in a week. And I thought, no, this is real. In fact, it wasn't even. And I thought, no, this is this is playing with fire. And then when I got together with my ex-boyfriend and he was alcoholic, he would drink every single, single mm. day of his life. Was that the guy who you had the affair with while your husband was still alive? Mm. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, in the last year okay. that he was still alive, yeah. And that was toxic, a toxic relationship right from... from terrible the word, relationship, right? terrible. Okay. And it lasted for 12 years. Oh, my word. Yeah. I hadn't been out at night for about two years. Friends dragged me off to the lookout deck in Hard Bay and the night when we arrived, they actually took me there to meet, to set me up with somebody whose wife had passed away okay. and ended up meeting um, this guy. A whole lot of girls arrived at the same time that a whole lot of guys arrived and the place was packed. There was a stunning band playing there every Saturday, Sunday night. So then we started going every Sunday. Just that one night a week I'd go out and do my own thing. Then I met him, wasn't even that attracted to him. And four months later, we started a relationship and I okay. just couldn't just end it. And he used cocaine and ecstasy at times. So even then in the beginning, um, I used it like a handful of times, left it alone, wasn't interested. Then when Ryan passed away, I decided that's it. You know, I'm not touching anything. And for 18 months, I didn't. Because okay. in that time period, it had literally been a handful of times. So not touching the stuff. This is, uh, I don't even know what I was thinking. I Ra think a logical thing would be this shit kills. So yeah. <laughs> so no, I mean, no, I mean, logically, I don't know what I was thinking with even trying it out, you know. Yeah. So then it was, this. it was 2006 that they'd both passed away, middle of 2006. By the middle of 2008, this relationship was crazy. It was, it was so abusive. Yeah. And that's when I started uh, started started to buy cocaine on my own. Um, got the number from the dealer that he used, 
from him and started using it every single day. Okay. And then I just couldn't stop. Mm. And, and in that period when you started using drugs, mm. was the relationship with God completely fucked? There was just nothing? Or I know. you didn't still try and keep that up? Uh, well, I didn't try. I mean, I didn't do anything to keep it going. Like, I didn't go to church. I didn't read my Bible. Um, I didn't socialize with other Christian people. But fundamentally, deep down inside, I still had the same beliefs. Okay, yeah. And I still felt that, you know, I knew that and I was a real sinner. But I was... That whole period of using, in any case, I was just living in denial. You know, I was just... My feelings around myself were so bad that I used to feel good so that I didn't have to feel those yeah. bad feelings. And when I used, I was okay. Yeah. And you were in a relationship that was supposed to make you feel good, but it was abusive. So yeah, it was abusive. I mean, we did have good times. Yeah. Obviously, we did have some good times. And there were a lot of laughs and fun around the whole using thing. And we, you know, we had a lot of fun at times, but it would always end up being abusive. Okay. So it wasn't happy. It was It was very... And I put a huge amount of effort into this relationship. He was 16 years younger than me. Okay. I put a huge amount of effort into that relationship to try and keep it going. And I'd resort to begging and pleading and writing letters and doing anything that I could. And I mean, although it sounds like, a, like you know, having lost all that money that we were absolute paupers, but by most people's standards, we actually weren't that badly yeah. off we could i still we'd still go overseas and we'd still go snow skiing and i even bought him a car and okay. in a sonar oh, wow. body and um we still lived pretty well but also i wasn't because especially because of the using yeah. it, i just wasn't living in any form of reality like yeah. thinking about what's lying around the corners just going through money at the rate of knots and yes. my using just made it 10 times worse mm. so by the time you ended up in treatment you were homeless no, not the first two times. Okay, oh yes, yeah. you did treatment twice. Yeah, before, before last year. I did in 2010 for 28 days. Um, was that when we met? No, it was, uh, no, that was a different treatment okay. centre. Went there for 28 days, used three times in treatment. Wasn't interested in coming clean. Didn't want to go to treatment, just went to please my daughter. Waste of money, 34,000 rand I remember for then, for 28 yeah. days. Mm didn't want to stay clean and when I came out I'd only been clean for nine days and I relapsed the same day again anyway okay. and then I went back in 2000 and uh, end of 2011 so it was basically 2012 because it was December okay. and that's the treatment center where we met when I was in secondary okay, yes. and then I was supposed to end this toxic relationship in with my counselor there in my the <laughs> counselor's room and we even had a role play in the room downstairs at secondary. I yeah. remember with the whole treatment center being involved with this breakup, this big breakup. Yeah. But meanwhile, we were allowed our phones at night. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. In secondary, we could have our phones at night and on the weekend. And I just messaged him the night before and I said, I'm going to be breaking up with you tomorrow, but it's not, it's not, it's just, it's just, it's not happening. And so he knew. So he came in and we did the breakup, but it wasn't a breakup. Oh, my word. And I was such a bloody scallum that every single message that we sent between each other, message, photograph, anything, I deleted it the minute I'd yeah. sent it in case my phone was ever checked. And one yes. day it was and there was nothing on it. So I was like, oh, I see I'm so good. I just uh, listen to everything that I'm such a told. bloody addict, yeah. <laughs> Oi. Yeah, and Tracy, that counsellor, she said to me, if you relapse, it's going to be on love addiction. And she was dead right. Because yeah. then I ended up relapsing the first weekend that I had free time going into tertiary on my four-month clean date. I relapsed because I was meeting him that day yeah. for the first time in four months. And four months of not seeing one another at all, we fought straight away. Straight away the abuse started. F m f verbal and emotional. Oh, my God. And even physical. Yeah actually so he just kept saying look at you and still an addict just buy pick up the phone phone the dealer and i was like fuck you and sorry and no, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the podcast is under the explicit um is not <laughs> explicit so people expect to hear the, the odd fuck <laughs> so um uh after listening to that for seven hours and fighting and 
you know, really hitting each other while we're driving in the car. Oh, my word. Uh, after four months of, like, always, like, texting at night. Oh, I miss you so much. And we'll get together and I'll be clean. And you must try not to go to the pub. And, you know, <laughs> load of pain <paint laughs> bullshit. And then, like, for, for within an hour. Because first of all, he arrives late. And he's only he drunk. Oh, no. <laughs> It's just a bloody disaster. So and you hung around. Yeah. So later that day, we uh, I thought, well, where do we go, actually? So I was, had some money. So I booked us into the... I had to be home at midnight. It was the curfew for yeah. Tushri. Booked us into the Duval Sun, or whatever it was called, hotel. That Eastern Boulevard. Or the, the highway, I still yeah. remember it was 800 Rand for the night. Okay. But uh, he could stay the night. I had to yeah. be back at midnight. And found the dealer and used and thought this is, well, I thought this is going to be fantastic. I haven't used for four months. Yeah. And I had one line and I thought, geez, thank heavens it was terrible because now I'm just going to throw it away. I don't need it anymore. Well, that didn't work. Yeah. Uh, and two hours later, I was on the phone ordering the next one and uh, I used right no. through the night. And in actual fact, I think that I left her Shri. Um, and walked down to the ATM at like two o'clock in the morning to buy m to get more money to order more cocaine, and but and then in the morning I had to go to an eight thirty NA meeting in Rose Street in the city centre, and I had a whole cup mug full of cocaine in my room and I didn't know what to do with it, and I went to that meeting saying I'm four months clean but I was as high as a cut. Oh my word! Yeah. Oi. And I even cheered. I used to chair an AA meeting in Seapoint every Thursday morning and I'd use cocaine right through the night. It was terrible. I mean, it's nothing to laugh about. I shouldn't be laughing, Good but it grief, was, yeah. yeah, no, it was terrible. It just shows yeah, that absolute unmanageability mm. and complete. Mm. No, it was terrible. And lied to my counsellor. And I think I became so good at lying that I could even yeah. change the expression in my eyes, you know. Yeah, and then after that, it was just downhill. So how long before you ended up in treatment then again? Five years of hell. Oh, my God. Five years. And I never thought I'd I go I can just imagine treatment. what hell that must have been. No, it was absolute hell. It was hell on earth. Every The first year, I left treatment in the middle of 2012. I still owned the house, but I gave her power of attorney, and they used to give me like 8,000 rand a month. Well, that certainly wasn't enough for me to live on with using. Yeah. So I had to use quite sparingly, and by the end of that year, the whole family was so fed up with me asking for money all the time that they just gave me what they agreed upon to give me, which was about 600,000 rand from the sale of the house. And the rest they used for other things, like such as a trust fund for Nicholas yeah. and things like that. Well, uh, you know, like, that's not peanuts, 600,000 yeah. rand. But I just managed to go through it all in about eight months. Oh, my God. Yeah. No thought of tomorrow. My reason can be beyond anything else, yeah. above everything else. I really? mean, I was paying rent and doing other yeah. buying stuff, but um, if I hadn't been using it, I just, I just had no concept of oh, yeah, yeah. the future. Yeah. Just everything revolved around drugs. Sure. Everything revolved around being I able know. to use. Oh, I know that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Danny, so by the time you got into the last treatment mm. facility, did you immediately reconnect with religion? Or was it? You know, before then, even. Because I remember in the last situation, in the last months, like praying a lot. Oh, is it? Okay. My situation was desperate. I was, back, I was still in this abusive relationship. Um, in fact, only a few months ago did I delete all the photos of, on my phone that I had of the ble bleeding and the bruises and oh all of that word. stuff. Um, it was like my life wasn't going anywhere. In fact, I just did actually wish that I was dead yeah. most of the time. So um, I was praying a lot. I was praying a lot. I was okay, desperate cool. for a way out of that situation. And then the treatment center was the answer. So that was the answer to your prayers. Mm. Cool. Yeah, very much so. So by the time you got in, the whole higher power thing wasn't a problem for you? Not at all. Oh, cool. In fact, I remember that um, thinking that when I was started with the step work again, because this is now the second time that I was starting to do step work, but, you know, because I lied my way, keeping that relationship going through my second treatment center, 
I was obviously lying in my step work as well. Yeah. So it wasn't that beneficial to me. Like, I don't really remember even doing a step yeah. five there. I can imagine. Um, so this time I really connected with what was... Fantastic. ...with what was going yeah. on in my life. And the fact that I had this quite a strong connection with my higher power was a huge help for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes it yeah. so much easier. Yeah, yeah. So right now, today, one yeah. year clean and had a strong spiritual connection. Connection with our friendship at the moment is, is your commitment to recovery and your commitment yeah. to service. And so that's lovely. Yeah, and I was thinking just the other day, you know, um, to me, you know, like all the suggestions of the 12-step program or the NA program is like the fund- the foundation of the whole thing to me is like, if I don't have that f- the foundation for me, I'm not saying it's like yeah. that for anybody else, but for me, it's like having that higher power connection. Yeah. So once that in- is in place, then I can start to build on the other things. And then what's essential, so you need that foundation, and the other essential things are like doing the 12 steps, having a sponsor, going to meetings. Because to me, those are like, those three things for me are therapy. Yeah. They, they work for me like therapy. Yes. And then... The other thing of doing service is just like reinforcing everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way it works for me. That's awesome. And it's working because you're working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. So that's excellent. Listen, thank you so much. You're very welcome. I so welcome. appreciate it. You're very, So was very it anything welcome. to be afraid of? No, no. Yeah. No, definitely not. <laughs> cool. <laughs> definitely not. Listen, thank, thank you, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank okay? you very much. Enjoy the rest Thanks of your day. Thanks for Yes, you too. I was stunned to hear what Janet has gone through on her path of life. I obviously hear many terrible stories in my counselling practice and by working with sponsees, and it never fails to amaze me by what the human psyche and body can endure. It was really wonderful to hear that Janet has endured life, but eventually decided to grab life by the balls and swing it around. I thoroughly enjoy the time I spend with Janet. We share a similar sense of humour and one night I nearly overturned the car from laughing so much while she was telling me about her thought process during one of her suicide attempts. Do not get me wrong, suicide is nothing to be laughed at and I take it very, very seriously. But from one warrior to another, we could see the insanity and find the humour in that. I am very grateful that Janet has survived and is part of my life. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za, or find me on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash freddy.org.za, or on Twitter at at Freddy. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. I want to thank you for listening. Be safe. Bye.